The Nintendo 64 released in 1996 and brought many firsts to video games. Its jump from 2D to 3D was massive. While admittedly limited in some areas, what it did bring were advanced 3D rendering techniques, including Z-buffering, anti-aliasing, and MIP mapping. The analog stick would provide unprecedented control in 3D environments and set a standard for the future. And the Rumble Pack, an add-on that added force feedback to games such as Star Fox 64, enhanced the immersion. The Nintendo 64 even skipped the 32-bit era, making it Nintendo's first 64-bit console, which incidentally, they wouldn't go back to until the Nintendo Switch launch in 2017. But back in 1996, leading up to the launch of the system, which had already suffered from a delay, the hype was massive. Multi-page magazine articles talked about the N64 like it was a supercomputer, the hype levels were off the charts, and it became hard to separate fiction from reality. The system would come standard with four controller ports, which was groundbreaking for the time. According to Shigeru Miyamoto, in the February 1996 edition of Next Generation magazine, he was quoted as saying, we have a machine with a fast enough CPU to handle four independent screens at speed. That's why we decided to include four joypad ports on the machine itself. This would be the dawn of four-player split-screen gaming, which would become another defining feature of the Nintendo 64. This capability would allow for four players to compete or cooperate on a single television screen, each with their own quadrant of the display. This would introduce a gaming experience that was revolutionary. This wasn't hype. This was a feature that worked exactly as advertised and made the N64 truly like it was unrivaled in terms of power and performance. While earlier 16-bit consoles would show off split-screen modes such as Super Mario Kart or Sonic 2, this was truly next level. The N64's focus on four-player split-screen tapped into a growing demand for living room gaming. As for me, I was just out of college when the N64 was released, and many of my friends and I played lots of four-player GoldenEye, Mario Kart 64, and Turok 2. This was during an era where online networking was still in its early stages of infancy due to lack of proper internet bandwidth. And the multiplayer aspect of the Nintendo 64 was quite incredible. But how exactly do developers manage to pull this off? Especially on the N64, where it seems like the majority of games struggle to run at more than 25 frames per second in a single player game. The addition of four player split screen seems unattainable, and yet there were some perfectly great four player split screen games that showed off incredible performance. Well as always, I decided to build my own C program to test out this functionality myself. Let's dive in. One of the coolest things about the Nintendo 64 undoubtedly is its four controller ports. Now, with the four controller ports, it was possible to play four-player split-screen games in some capacity. So there were various games out there that allowed you to play four-player split-screen. The most popular ones, obviously, were games such as Mario Kart 64, Diddy Kong Racing, F-Zero X come to mind. Even the multiplayer portions of games such as Conker's Bad Fur Day allowed for four-player split-screen. And it was one of the biggest selling points of the hardware that kind of put it above and beyond its competition, including the Sony PlayStation. Now, of course, the Sony PlayStation did have its own means of playing four-play games, but out of the box, the N64 came with four controller ports, and this was a really big deal because it was unheard of at the time. Now, when we talk about the Nintendo 64, there is a lot of confusion and, I guess, questions about how its performance is. Now, we know that many games on the N64 didn't run particularly well, but there were other games that ran at 60 frames per second, and some games such as F-Zero ran at 60 frames per second with four-player split-screen. So the N64 has a lot of power under the hood, and it really came down to the developers and how they were able to optimize code for the system. Now, back in the day, the development kit that Nintendo had provided for Nintendo 64, while it was very, very good, it was not optimal, and I think a lot of developers struggled to really kind of come to terms with how to best optimize its performance. In this day and age with modern compilers and a lot of reverse engineering that we know about, 
it is a lot easier to kind of get really good performance out of the N64 at levels that we had never seen before. And I'm talking about um, some of the demos that you may have seen in recent times that really show off the power of the N64. So I'm going to demonstrate a four player split screen setup here. Now this is a very simple application that I've built in C that is a spinning cube. Now it's a pretty basic spinning cube. There's no texturing at all and it's just rotating on the uh, Y and the X axis, as you can see here. Now with the controller, if I grab this controller here, I can actually um, adjust the rotation by pressing the L and R buttons. I can also use the analog stick to move the cube around, and there is, I think there's a basic light source that has been implemented here as well. Now this particular demo isn't very interesting, but let's go ahead and now plug in a, another controller. So let's grab our blue controller here, and then plug this in. Now this will set up a two player split screen. Now with this controller, the blue controller, player two, I can independently mess around with the cube. Now one of the things that I want to be very clear on is that this is the same cube. The only difference here is that I'm texturing them differently as far as the vertex colors. So the vertex colors are being kind of adjusted per viewport or per instance here but the cube itself is exactly the same. Now, we can also add another controller. Let's add a third controller. In fact, let's add a third and a fourth controller. When we add a third controller, as you can see here, we added the third controller, which is spinning as well, but the fourth player is not because we still haven't added the player four in. Now, if we do that, player four gets added. Now, you can see here that for really no apparent loss in performance, we've been able to set up a four player split screen game, if you will, which has the spinning cubes with different vertex colors and we're able to adjust the zooming and the rotation per instance here. And this is the basis of setting up a four player split screen game on the Nintendo 64. It was something that pretty much was available to any developer should they choose to do so and it was a very, very powerful feature that a lot of developers took advantage of. As we look into this code, let's discuss some theory. If I'm playing a single N64 game, there is a standard viewport defined that's probably running at 320 by 240 resolution. In order to view 3D images on a 2D display, we must set up a projection into that viewport and define our camera that we use. Pretty standard stuff, right? Well, the N64's 3D API, as is the case for almost every 3D graphics API out there, allows for multiple viewports that can be defined each with their own camera, but into the same scene. In the case of a four-player split screen, we divide the screen into four smaller viewports, 160 pixels wide by 120 pixels in height, and define a camera per viewport. Then it's possible to render geometry into each viewport. We can also define our four individual joysticks and then detect if they're being connected or disconnected and adjust our viewports accordingly. We can also store the individual camera positions per viewport. So if you look at our code here, our viewport definition, this is where we define our four viewports that also contain individual camera and color values. But also notice we only have a single set of cube vertices. Our main function sets up an OpenGL context, sets up the cameras, defines the perspective and frustrum, and enables a light source. The main loop polls the joypads for connection or disconnection. It will update the viewports depending on the number of players connected. For example, if only one player is connected, we only have one viewport with a maximum size of 320 by 240. If two are connected, we define two viewports with a horizontal split screen. In other words, they are both 320 pixels wide by 120 pixels in height. And with the three or four players, we have our four player viewport defined at 160 by 120 pixels per viewport. We update camera positions per controller. And then for each viewport, we set up our projections and update our camera. Then the render underscore cube function does exactly that. It renders our cube. It also adds some color to the default vertex colors to distinguish between them so they don't all appear the same. And that's pretty much it. The program loops continuously, checking for controller input and updating each viewport based on that. Incidentally, the code for this demo is on my GitHub page. Link is in the description below. If you want to play around with it yourself, you do need libdragon to compile it and I do recommend using an emulator such as Ares to test your work on. 
Now at this point you might be thinking, the code now is performing four times the processing and four times the rendering. Wouldn't this slow down games to a crawl? Well, some four-player split-screen games do suffer in performance, but the MIPS CPU on the N64 is quite powerful and could very easily manage four instances of game processing. The rendering would be trickier, however. Many games would resort to reduced texturing, draw distances, and other reductions in geometry to keep the frame rate as smooth as possible. But because in four-player mode, each viewport is one quarter of the screen, this was an acceptable trade-off as the player didn't really need all that detail anyway, or they probably wouldn't even notice it and would be a waste of processing. In the best case scenario, a game like F-Zero X has a reduction in geometry, but still manages 60 frames per second with all four players. Other split-screen games like Mario Kart 64 and Diddy Kong Racing feel just as smooth as they do in single-player. Turok Rage Wars has reduced geometry and textures but runs really well in four-player mode. It's a simple trade-off between detail and performance. Turok 2's four-player mode in comparison is quite choppy. Perfect Dark was one of the most ambitious titles for the Nintendo 64, and its 4-play multiplayer would influence future FPS games. It introduced simulants or AI bots to its matches, and it pushed the console harder than any other game, requiring the 4MB expansion pack for full access to the multiplayer features. Its high-res mode enhanced the screen resolution to 640x222, which put more strain on the 4-player split-screen viewport allocation. As a result, various optimizations such as geometry reduction, fog and reduced draw distances were implemented to keep the action as smooth as possible. It was still playable, but the frame rate would suffer. Perfect Dark perhaps was too ambitious for the hardware. The amount of processing between frames was significant enough to handle a multiplayer match with AI bots alone. Then by applying 4-player split-screen multiplayer, you can see why it was so ambitious and it would often slow down into the teens in terms of frame rate. But the multiplayer was so addictive and fun that it was later refined for the later Time Splitters games. Bot matches were introduced in games such as Quake 3 Arena, Halo, and Unreal Championship that all appeared on later consoles. Perfect Dark was an important game, and the Nintendo 64 hardware, thanks to its computational processing ability and its advanced and fast 3D, was the first to pull it off. And with that, we're going to leave it here for today's episode. I do hope you enjoyed a look at 4-play split screen on the Nintendo 64 and how developers managed to pull off the particular effect. I think it's an interesting one, and it was undoubtedly a key pillar in what made the Nintendo 64 such a success. As always, I will have various links to everything that you saw in this episode, including the source code example of setting up a 4-player split-screen mode that runs natively on N64 hardware. You can use an EverDrive cartridge or an emulator, as mentioned, to test out this yourself. But we'll leave it here for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, please don't forget to leave me a thumbs up, and we will catch you guys in the next episode. Bye for now.